On this Wild Tata episode, we will be traveling to Northern Europe to visit a country called Lithuania, to experience melt fishing on the Koronian Lagoon next to the Baltic Sea, visit Neris River Regional Park together with ecologist and guide Taras Buyanauskas, who will give us a tour around this park and share historical and ecological facts about this region. Later, we will climb the small Mount Girene to meet a person who will introduce us with one of the oldest Lithuanian music instruments. Join us for Wild Tado, Lithuania. Our journey began in western Lithuania, at the freshwater, highly biodiverse Kronin Lagoon, where at this time of the year, usually from January till March, many anglers are heading to catch the European smelt, a small and very delicious fish that comes to spawn into the freshwater. This Kronin Lagoon is separated from the Baltic Sea by the long, thin sand dune Kronin Spit, at which northern end there is a passage to the Baltic Sea naturally formed around 5,000 years ago, when glacial moraines serves as its foundation. Winds and sea currents later contribute enough sand to raise and keep the formation above the sea level. So tonight we're fishing for European smelt at Coronian Lagoon with my dad and his friend. So we're fishing... Oh, I think we got one. Nope. So the system is very simple. We're using a one rod for each person and each rod has approximately about six, uh, six hooks. On each hooks we're putting uh, small pieces of uh, chopped carp yeah, and that's how we're catching the smelt. So we caught already about probably around 8 kilograms of smelt. You just put this system on the bottom and you wait until the fish strikes. So very often you can catch uh, 3 or 4 European smelts in one go. The air temperature is about, probably is going to be about minus 1 because we can see some frost on the rod tip and it's getting slightly difficult to reel the, the line inside the inside the reel. So now it's 8 p.m. We came about 5 o'clock and we're planning to stay probably till about 6 in the morning. So the system is very simple. You just look at the at the at your rod tip and then when it starts shaking you're gonna lightly strike and lift the fish up. So I'm gonna try to catch a few fishes to show how, how it works. Oh, there you go. I think I got one. There you go. It's quite small, but that's the size of European smelt. 
So here's the system. We got a um, lead shot about 20 grams on the bottom. That's the lead shot. And we got about from three to six hooks or eight hooks, depending, depends from the fisherman. So basically on the hook we put this small small piece of uh, carp. The hook could be different colors, but the most popular system is with the phosphor, so it flashes green in the, in the, in the water. And for the fish it's much easier to see where the bait is. So you can see that's the European smelt. It has little teeth, it's quite a small fish. So we're gonna catch some, we're gonna catch more of the fish and we're gonna take home to cook. There's so many more, many more fishermen around us. So it is extreme fishing, but it's really enjoyable. And you know, this, this fishing you can, you can do like only a couple of times a year. Normally we fish from ice, but this year there was no winter in, in, in Lithuania and probably most of the Europe. Like even, even uh, Sweden and, and Russia, part of the Russia is, is, is quite warm. So normally we would be catching these kind of uh, fish from the ice when drilling the ice and using a small rods. And similar technique, just this time we have to fish from the boat. This small fish is so popular in Lithuania that every year there is a traditional fisherman festival called Palanga Smelt. Started in 2004 as an idea to attract tourism, this event is being hosted in February and attracting 40,000 visitors in one weekend. At this festival, visitors can try smelt cooked in a variety of ways, also take part in fishing traditions, games and competitions, and even join a group of health lovers swimming in the iced Baltic sea water. We finished fishing early in the morning and headed back to the shore, having 30 kilograms of smelt caught between three people. Later that day, our fish was ready for hot smoking. We used a custom handmade steel smoke box, specially designed for smoking fish outdoors. Alder tree is one of the best wood for it. While burning, it produces a lot of flavored smoke. Also an important factor, a wet alder sawdust is being placed inside on the bottom of the box while firewood is being burned from the bottom. It creates a smoke perfect for our fish. The next day, we headed to Nervis Regional Park to meet with ecologist Taras Buyanauskas. Hi, so we are in Lithuania at Neris Regional Park and I'm standing here with ecologist Taras Buyanauskas. Hi, how are you doing? So today we'll be visiting the park and we'll be covering 10 to 15 kilometers of this area. We'll be looking at natural reserve places, heritage places, historical places, castle hills, uh, natural reserves, everything that is the most amazing in this area. So join us today and let's go. So Neris Regional Park is almost in the middle of Lithuania nearby our capital Vilnius. Uh, Neris Regional Park is 30 kilometers long. Uh, it's a bit tricky because there are two sides of the Neris Regional Park. It's the right side of the river and the left side of the river. And there is only one bridge right here that you can cross. So basically, if you want to go from the right side of the park to the left side, you have to go almost 60 kilometers loop to reach the other part of it. Our speciality is the oak forest. So the biggest oak forest in Lithuania is right here. And it would start right here somewhere. You can find lots of oaks. This is the biggest oak forest in Lithuania. And there is the uh, strict reserve area. So you can't come here because it's uh, really uh, precious for our, uh, for our nature. Uh, but if you look at the whole forest, it would be like uh, this sized and even more to the uh, up. And this forest was in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. But right now we have only this part left where you can find this oak forest in Lithuania. The size of the park is this bright green line. Uh, you can see it. And for visiting park, you have 
well, it's not mandatory to buy the ticket. There is a visitor ticket. It costs one euro for one person for 24 hours. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's not mandatory. So if you voluntarily want to help us to have this territory for the people, so people pay it. You can buy it for a week ticket or you can buy it for a month. Uh, it's possible to buy a ticket by the sh short message or you can come to our visitor center here in Dukstos and you can buy the paper ticket if you want. The oldest map we have of the park in the park actually, it was found in archives. It's 1775 map uh, made by the Polish. You can see the names of the cities, rivers and so on are in Polish and it's interwar period of Lithuania uh, where the Polish were occupied part of Lithuania. Tadas also share information about Lithuanian Easter traditions. You know that in the Bible, when the Christ was reborn, the Easter festival, all the thing, people uh, were having this festival and used palm branches to, to, to for it. And here in Lithuania, we use these dry flower bouquets. And this is the speciality, one of the specialities of the park. If you look at the emblem of the park, at the top, you would see this kind of similar thing to this one. Uh, so in this region, in Vilnius region, uh, people would make these and sell them. And then the tradition of having these bouquets during the Easter spread through the whole Lithuania. But the center of it was nearby here in our park. The other thing you would see at the bottom, there are some acorns and oak leaves. So that's the uh, natural part, the special, uh, speciality of the park, that's the oak forest. So this, in our uh, Neris Regional Park, we have the biggest oak forest in Lithuania. The oaks that grow actually as in forest. And you can see the, in the middle, the white line. So the white line symbolizes the river Neris. So all the lines you can see here on the map is the, the, uh, uh, how the Neris River moves, and this is our, our, what, why our emblem is like it is here. Our first stop was Karmazini Hiking Trail. So we are on the way to the first place, which is Karmazini Hiking Trail. While walking the path, I noticed something that looked like old trenches. Taras explained that these were World War I trenches, still visible more than 100 years later. A nearby sign that reads, a place where two powers clashed. In many wooded areas of this park, people can see ditches dug in the soil. These are the trench of First World War, where Russian troops were protecting themselves from the German soldiers. In the autumn of 1915, the Dukstos neighborhood was a battlefield. The German army attempted to encircle the established Russian troops and occupy what is now a current capital of Vilnius. The success of battle of Dukstos was changing after breaking through the defensive lines of the Russian army on the night of August the 30th. The next day, the Germans had been pushed back. However, after a couple of weeks, the German army resumed its attack across the entire Shagala line of defense and a few days later, on September 19, it occupied Vilnius and then almost all of the ethnographic Lithuania. Uh, so we are by Neris River. Uh, Neris River is the longest river we have here in Lithuania. It's uh, almost 600 kilometers going through Lithuania. Uh, it's really special for Lithuanians and not only, because when the salmon from the sea comes here into this river, there are lots of people coming here. And you see this trail we are walking here? There are lots of people walking and these trails look, I don't know, like highway probably, because yeah. there are so many fishermen came in, coming from Russia, from Norway, from Poland, here just to catch a fish. I don't know, maybe from even further away uh, people coming. Lots of Lithuanians also come here uh, to catch the salmon. 
Uh, season here starts uh, in September 10th and uh, actually when you can fish salmon legally when it comes here it's from September 10th uh, to October 10th so only one month for people to catch salmon on its migration uh, later on you can start fishing again salmon from New Year so from February 1st and then uh, almost till March uh, you can fish salmon, but it's not, you know, so big of a thing. Uh, what's also interesting, this uh, Neris River, it's uh, historically uh, where lots of boating, rafting on it, and people, when they were cutting logs, they would use the river f to uh, uh, have these logs transported from spot to spot. And if you look at the map, we have lots of names of the rocks on the map. Uh, so those rafters that were uh, having these logs going through the river, they named rocks because they needed to know the names of the rocks and the spots the rock is, that they would know they have to go around it or not, you know, to go on that spot with their logs and they just, you know, camp uh, somewhere in the middle of the river. So there are lots of stories how people, I don't know, the devil had a rock and brought that rock and he fell down and the rock is now here. Yeah. Or there are some... I know, damned wedding and they made some kind of bridge that the groom and the bride could meet each other from the different sides of the river yeah. and you have this spot with those, you know, nivelovets around here. So lots of interesting stories that this river have uh, on, on the things around it. After listening all these stories about fishing in this area, I decided to escape Tara's company and try my luck in this water. Although I knew and been advised by a number of anglers that because of warm climate this winter, fish are not feeding as they would in normal winter conditions. And chances to catch something in this river at this time are close to zero. But there is always hope. Being spotted fishing by Taras, I've been pulled back to the shore to continue our journey. The next stop was confluence of Dukshta and Neris rivers. After cooling our feet in the river, we headed to the oak forest, where more lessons about this region was waiting for us. So in this forest, the Grand Dukes of Lithuania, they were actually hunting here. And these oaks, they are like 100, 150 years old. So they probably haven't seen those Grand Dukes, you know, riding on their horse and trying to pierce with a spear some huge boar. And talking about the boars and eating stuff, would you like a cup of tea? Sure, yeah. Okay, let's go. Yeah, I have a seat. Okay. Ooh. Ready? Thank you. I'm gonna hold this for you. 
we won't waste this precious drink in the forest. Sure. I don't know where you get it from, but that oh, is you know. the reality. Oh, you know, it's Lithuania. Cheers. Mm. Pretty tea from the forest. You know, we Lithuanians knew how to do their stuff. As I said, Absolutely. it's like Grand Duke walked here and, you know, his servants would prepare him maybe his herbal tea, maybe Midas yeah. drink somewhere in deep in the forest. So we are kind of having the same drink, maybe the Grand Duke's drunk. Yeah, yeah British love this, this uh, black tea with milk tea, yeah. uh, but for us we would drink some herbal tea, so uh, it's really popular to, to know the recipes to help with your health about this herbal tea and Lithuanians to this day they use uh, tea f to help with the flu, to help uh, with their aching uh, legs or something like, like that yeah. and it's really popular. Now maybe people move to the cities not so much they know about it but they still come back to a park and they ask for these recipes of us and we are walking and sometimes it's strange for them that uh, all around, you know, all different things, you can still use them. And even here we have these dry oak leaves, but if they weren't dry, if they were still green, you could use them uh, for the tea and you would have some special properties for it. Uh, so if you brew them one way, you can get, let's say, something that colors wool and you can get color out of it. Also, you can get tea that helps with your health, so it's really different. If it's young oak, you can use its bark also for making tea or something like that. So it's really beautiful because here in the nature, everything has their purpose. And, well, sometimes we are searching for this purpose in our lives, but in the nature, they actually just do what they do. Also, this forest is really special, not only about its historical value and cultural value, like we had these sacred oak trees and stuff, but right now, uh, we are... After having afternoon tea in the oak forest, and before the dark, we headed to Bividei Castle Hill. So yeah, so I see the sunset, sun going down, we have these cowboy hats, and I have to do this. So now we are at the spot where this place called Buivide uh, Castle Hill or Mound. It's artificially made by the people. And these mounds, they were made at the spots that were naturally good for defense. Yeah. Uh, but the humans would improve it that the defense would be even better. This hill we are climbing, it's also made by the people. Further there, you can see this kind of mud wall there. Yeah. And that mud wall also is made by the people. And we have nearby other uh, mound, uh, Bradeliska's mound, and archaeologists say that on that mound people lived like for 2,000 years, and this is really long period. And so-called cultural layer is two meters thick, so it's really big, you know. When the mole makes its hole through there, and you see this ground coming up, you know, by, made by the mole, on that ground you can find some shards of the pots. Yeah. So there are lots of those archaeological uh, artifacts you can find here. And here there are not so many of those archaeological artifacts. Uh, but you can see uh, that uh, turning around that this is really good place for defense because from that side we have Dukšta river there is also this deep part where the water would come still and here we have only entrance uh, to this part so it's really easy to defend because you just need to place some uh, uh, wall here and this is the only spot you have to defend the Crusaders, they would come to Lithuania during the winter because Lithuania was a really swampy area and they needed to swamps to be, you know, icy, like they wouldn't go deep inside. Uh, so they would come for the winter. So Lithuanians would pour water on these hills that they couldn't climb up, they would just slip down. And now we can see there are lots of trees around here growing. And uh, at that time, everything was open that you could see when the crusaders are coming so close to you. Was open, all, all this area. 
Uh, well, archaeologists say that, let's say, 100 meters, uh, because arrow could fly that distance, like 60, 50 meters, that would, was not like normal arrow distance. Yeah. So around 100 meters should have been the open area around uh, uh, the castle that stood. So castles here were only wooden ones, uh, maybe some wooden walls, so not so big ones. And actually there, you can see the other hill there, that's Buivedeman. So that one I mentioned to you, that was for 2000 lift place. And this one is really fresh and this is probably an unfinished project. Uh, because not so many archaeological artifacts around here. Uh, archaeologists think that times changed and you didn't even need these kind of structures to defend your lifestyle, to, to defend yourself. This spot is really interesting uh, because here uh, we're gonna see Dukshta River Valley. Uh, now it's deep winter, not so, many snow, not so much snow this year, uh, but it's really pretty in the autumn because you can see all kind of different colors. Here you can see some birches, uh, so we have these yellowish trees. Somewhere in the middle there are some maple trees, so we can get this orange red color. Uh, further, you can see some spruce trees, so you get this beautiful green color. And at the back, uh, there is this oak forest where you get this reddish and yellowish colors. So this wall is really, really beautiful because you have these different kind of trees and so many different kind of colors. Uh, so this is one of my favorite spots in autumn uh, in the park. You can see the Dukhshta River. At the bottom, this is Dukhshta River Valley. You can see some flat ground around there. That's Ajolei Hill, yeah. a bit closer yeah. and to the left. There is Karmazine uh, Castle Hill also, so it's really yeah. nearby. That spot today is a really popular wedding spot. Like Lithuanians still tend to have these pagan traditions. And yeah. if per people want pagan weddings, that spot is quite popular for that. At the end of the day, the last stop was to refresh with pure spring water. So we are by the Restinani Springs water. Cheers! <sighs> nice one. Thanks for today, Tadis. That was the end of the short tour around nearest regional park. Before heading to the final place, we stopped to try our luck with float fishing. Did they reward us only with small fish? Meanwhile, our neighbor anglers were more successful, pulling decent roach and chub just a couple of meters from us. These people are fishing here regularly and have their own type of system and bait ready. And we, being just a guest, had to satisfy with the second best. deep-rooted traditions of fishing is in many Lithuanians. Some of them express their love for these water creatures by spending their free time in the shed, handcrafting the wood and later decorating their house with these art pieces. Like this house owner who lives close to the river. And now it's time to meet a very special person, which is right on top of this mountain. This and other mounds are naturally formed hills and embankments with man-made offensive fortifications, slopes, embankments, ditches and terraces. The small mounds Jivene are located in the confluence of the Neris and Schlene rivers. 
Being one of the largest in Lithuania, it reaches up to 43 meters high. There are 1,000 mounds in Lithuania. The first mounds in the Baltic territories appear between 2nd and 1st millennium before the Christ. During the establishment of the Lithuanian state and during the battles with Crusaders and the Livonian Order, beginning from the 12th till 15th centuries, mounds with up to 5 ramparts and ditches up to 3 meters deep were erected. In their places stood strong wooden castles. 100 to 150 defenders were assigned to defend against looting attacks, especially intensified since the 13th century, with the establishment of the Order of the Swords and Crusaders in the Baltics. Together with other castles in the lower reach of the Neris River, the castle of small Mount Girene formed the defensive system of central Lithuania, and it became the center of it. After the Battle of Jalgiris in 1410 and Pabaiskas in 1435, the wooden castles in Lithuania lost their significance and the mounds were abandoned. The mound and its 4.8 hectare territory is protected by the state as a historical and heritage monument. Half of the mound has already been washed away by the river Neris. Several dozen meters have disappeared in the last hundred years. Every year on July 6th, the state anthem is sung on this mound to mark the coronation of King Mindaugas on 6th of July, 1253, who was considered to be the first Grand Duke of Lithuania and the first and only King of Unified Lithuania. We are 20 kilometers from Kona city on small Mount Jirene and I'm sitting here today with the musician Gedra Tutkute. So can you please uh, tell us about this instrument? Uh, this instrument is called Kankles. Uh, the people start playing it uh, in a stone age. Uh, this type of Kankles have 12 strings. Uh, other regions have uh, uh, 9 strings and uh, uh, other one region also have um, Kankles with five strings is the oldest Kankles. First of all, this uh, instrument was played to please God and uh, relaxed after hard work in the fields. Uh, later, it was um, it, they were playing uh, in the, some kind of celebrations like wedding, baptism, and in just simple dances. Uh, so, how long it takes to learn play this instrument? To understand how it's played, you can like about two weeks, okay. but to master it, you need like a year or two. I I am personally playing uh, eight years, so I'm play. I try to play the best I can. So you started playing since a very early age. Yeah. And did you? How did you find out about this instrument? Did your parents show you, or you? Uh, my. A teacher showed me. Uh, she wanted, she thought that I have a voice uh, to sing and uh, said, I have one friend that is in music school, teacher in music school. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, she suggested me to go there. I start singing and this instrument came uh, with the singing. So. 
I am in the uh, group of people in the Vitutas Magnus University, mm -hmm. uh, and we are traveling, uh, traveling around uh, Lithuania and mm -hmm. other countries showing uh, uh, Lithuanian traditional songs, dances, and music. And recently we were in the Germany, um, Sweden, and Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, from small Mount Gerenai, Giedria Tutkute.